understand it. We still have people wondering in, but okay, we're good to go. All right, they might miss the, the housekeeping part. Um, anyway, my name is Jeff Matheson, and I'm the, the BC Regional Director for the Western and Northern Canada affiliate of the IAIA. And uh, we've got a few people in the room here and on the phone that are involved with, um, with the affiliate. Um, this is our first um, event that we're having this fall. We're a little bit uh, slow to start. Um, we normally do, for those that are somewhat new to the IAIA, uh, there are events that are held uh, often in Vancouver and in Calgary and in Yellowknife and, um, and around Western Northern Canada. Um, speaking for the Vancouver or the BC chapter, we call it. We call it a chapter, but we're all, we're all actually part of the, uh, of the overall WNC. Uh, we work to uh, organize events for BC practitioners that are of interest and, uh, and uh, also support uh, events and activities of the, uh, of the broader affiliate as well too. Um, some of the ideas that we've got uh, cooking for the next, uh, for this next, um, for this, I guess the rest of this fall, we'll probably get one more talk in this fall, and we'll have a few things set up for, uh, for, the, for the winter and the spring. But uh, some of the ideas that uh, we're swirling around here are um, uh, ecosystem services in, in environmental planning, um, lots of interest in strategic environmental impact assessment, uh, impact benefit agreements, and um, we did have a, uh, that workshop in the spring that some of you were at on professional reliance, and we're hoping to do some kind of follow-up on that. Um, improving professional judgment is another one that I know that uh, people are hungry for after seeing that talk uh, at our, uh, our workshop in the spring. And uh, we're hoping to put together uh, one of our annual uh, EA updates where we uh, have often been able to get some uh, presentation or a representative from SIA and from, uh, from the EAO to, uh, to talk about uh, new initiatives that are happening with the agencies. Anyway, so stay tuned for that. Um, I'll, I'll turn this over in just a moment, uh, but I will say washrooms are out by the elevators where you came up. There is coffee and there's water and there's hot water for tea as well in the back. This is a, a lunch and learn or a brown bagger or whatever you want to call it, so please feel free to eat or drink. Anyway, um, okay, I'll turn it over to Matt Hammond, Matt Hammond very briefly here. Sure. Thanks everyone for coming, and uh, I thought I'd introduce Pat because uh, uh, Alan Ehrlich, who's on the line, and, and I were talking with Pat at the uh, last IAIA International Conference in uh, in Puebla, in Mexico, and I think that it's probably over a beer after the after the day. And Pat was telling some of these stories, and you know, it's, I think it was originally Alan's idea, and I fully supported the idea of, of actually getting Pat to give a presentation to to some of the local folks here because. Uh, I think there's not many people who uh, who were doing the work that was Pat, that Pat was doing uh, early on in the uh, EA policy development uh, in Canada that uh, that that are actually available to give presentations like this. So, um, <clears throat> uh, my name is Matt Hammond, by the way. I'm the uh, what's my role now? Pro program director for the same affiliate that. Uh, <laughs> that uh, Jeff just mentioned, so the Western and Northern Canada affiliate of IAIA. So primarily my role is to try and coordinate some events across Western and Northern Canada with input from the different uh, groups in Calgary and Yellowknife and Edmonton and, and, and Vancouver. There's some folks in Victoria as well. So, so uh, feel free to approach me with any, any ideas that you may have, anything related to impact assessment, because uh, uh, we're a group that's uh, very flexible with, uh, with helping out um, particular events and, and collaborating with different groups where there's reasons to advance the practice of impact assessment, which is our, our mandate. So. so I'm just going to introduce Pat. Uh, his background, background is in forestry and land use planning with uh, training from UBC, Yale, and Minnesota. He managed for, forest research and, and Canada land inventory nationally for the Canadian Forestry Services and then joined Environment Canada in its infancy. Uh, this led to managing EIA practices in the Maritimes and in the Prairies and the North, as well as secondments to the UN, uh, to UNEP in South America and Africa. Since 1988, Pat has continued consulting to domestic and international clients in some 40 countries. And uh, uh, just scrolling through his uh, project experience, there's an impressive array of countries. So Mongolia, Cambodia, uh, Russia, Mozambique, and Yemen. So, you know, 
Pat has been an important export commodity for uh, Canadian <laughs> expertise, and, and I think we're very lucky to have him here today to share that with us. Although we're going to focus on the Canadian Canadian case, and, and uh, uh, you know, Pat's most uh, recently co-authored uh, the EIA guidelines for the FAO uh, for the UN. That's the Food and Agricultural uh, Organization, uh, and uh, Pat lives with with his wife Elizabeth, near his kids in North Vancouver, which is handy for his passions for a master's alpine skiing and uh, Alpine Club uh, Canada related activities. So uh, thanks Pat. Well we've got we're at ten after, so I think it's gonna be about a forty minute presentation, which should leave us enough time for some questions after after the presentation. So welcome Pat Duffy. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, welcome to this meeting, everybody. It's great to be with the IAEA crowd and their guests. And uh, glad that people from Calgary and Illinois were tuned in. And uh, I want to thank Jeff for hosting us and you, Matt, for putting this together. And I, so I'm going to be talking about the federal EIA policy and procedure and how it got started, how it launched. And, uh, before I go on, I have to thank just a few people who tipped in some very vital information to me. Some of you may know Bob Connolly, you may know Bill Couch, you may know Barry Sadler. These are all members who have uh, been very helpful to me and lived through some of what I'm going to tell you about here. So I've got to go back about 40 years and I'm going to go through, I'm going to motor through this, but I want you to pick up on some of my questions and people that I'd like you to ask me about afterwards or sometime in the next week or so. So some of the specifics may be missing. Uh, this is one person's view. It's my responsibility, but there's some serendipity and it's really one view of what happened. So I have to go back to UBC in the 50s when I was in an outdoor club and I met a guy called Jack Stathers who later became the executive director of the UBC Alumni Association. And while I was at UBC, I was thinking, I think I'd like to go to grad school soon rather than later. And a prof got hold of me and he said, listen, Dad, throw a wide net. Try and look around the continent and see where you can get to a good school. To make a long story, story short, I wound up at Yale. I was single. The vets in my graduate class quite an international class, he looked at me and said, well, you're single, why don't you serve as the president of our student body? I said, well, it's fine, I can do that. The next thing I knew, the, the, the dean said, well, now, Pat, your job is going to be to introduce guests, line up speakers, and arrange parties. So we had a great time. I mean, it was a great time at Yale. And one day, two visitors appeared from Vassar College, the ladies' college in in New York. Martha Hain and Elizabeth Cushman. And they were at Yale to research a thesis on getting volunteer interns at U.S. national parks. Somebody asked me about Elizabeth Cushman afterwards or at the end of the session, please. So anyway, Martha and I hit it off. We became what you would call an item for a couple of years all over the continent. And now I've got to go into what was happening in, at that time in the, in, the, in the mid to late 50s. The U.S. Wilderness Bill was going through Congress. Can you imagine how controversial that was? I'm a forester. I went to the Society of American Foresters annual convention in Salt Lake City, and the president of the wilderness organization appeared, an elderly gentleman, and forcefully <coughs> sold wilderness or tried to sell wilderness to the foresters. I think that events like this help to arouse the U.S. interest in nature, and wilderness, and environment, and a lot of it was carrying over into Canada. So, and about a year later, I married my Elizabeth from Vienna. Martha married Lee Talbot, a wildlife biologist working on a doctor's degree on wildebeest in Kenya. Remember Lee Talbot? So, 
I found myself working in Calgary and Ottawa. There I was with my families. Jack Stathers would hound me and say, you know, the Alumni Association needs some beefing up. Can you get in there and sort of get things organized? Which I did. And in Ottawa, I met people like Tom DeQuino, and I met a man called John Carson, who was a UBC grad, originally from BC Electric, BC Hydro. And, you know, we became friends running this Ottawa branch. So, I was in forestry and in Canada land inventory, managing a national program, federal, provincial. And I heard about a course, career assignment program course, where you go for a 12-week intense training here in Ottawa, in residence. And uh, you have 48 participants, and there are six syndicates that have to do their work on a problem that a client in government wants solved. And it's gotta be a serious problem. So, I really wanted to go on this course, but the Forest Service said, stay where you are, Duffy, we'll take care of you. And the next thing I knew, they wanted to move me to Edmonton to work on the Mackenzie Valley pipeline, early studies. And I said to my boss, as nice as I could, I said, I'd like to take this course. He said, uh, I think, you, I think you better be prepared to go and see the assistant deputy minister who was an elderly scientist who reckoned that he'd take care of me if I stayed in the Forest Service. So imagine this. I hear that I'm going to be moved to Edmonton, and the next thing I knew, the assistant deputy minister calls me into his office and said, okay, Duffy, 10 o'clock in the morning, we're moving you to Edmonton. Can you handle that? I said, geez, Malcolm, I'm not sure I can take this course. He said, listen come back at 2 o'clock and give me your answer. These are undisclosed secrets, by the way. Nobody's heard these stories. <laughs> so I politely excused myself, went back to my office, and I thought, boy, Duffy, you are in a corner. And then I realized that a man called Peter Norton was leaving the Forest Service to go and become the Dean of Forestry. So I said, Peter, we're old friends. What shall I do? He said, listen, Pat, stick to your guns. Went back to my office and said, that's a, that's a lot of help. It's getting on towards noon, and I've got to see Malcolm at 2 o'clock, so I thought to myself, I'm going to phone John Carson, who, ladies and gentlemen, was the president of the Public Service Commission of Canada, in charge of hiring, firing, classification, training, and this course I wanted to go on was his baby. He really liked this course, so I phoned John at noon, and the only phone in his office was the phone on his table. He said, oh, hi, Pat. I've got my feet on the table. I'm having a sandwich. What's up? So I began to talk to him about the jam I was in. He said, I really want to take this course. But Malcolm wants to send me to Edmonton. Very shortly thereafter, John said, Pat, you're going on that course. I don't know what happened in the hour or two afterwards, but I went to see Malcolm at 2 o'clock. He went right through the roof when he heard that I really wanted to go on this course. They eventually got another man to do the job in the Mackenzie, and those of you in Alberta may know Everett Peterson, who went on to become a very, very competent consultant in Alberta. So there I went off to this course, met my group, and we had to go to find that client for the problem. So I worked for Al Davidson in Canada Land Inventory, the assistant deputy minister in the new Department of the Environment, brand new. Suggested, with suggestions from the group, I'd go and see some people, but they, they said, I think we should see Davidson. So we called up his office. The secretary said, Mr. Davidson will see you at 6 o'clock on Monday night. He thought, well, this must be a pretty busy office. This guy is the ADM for policy planning in the new Department of the Environment. So we sit around like a bunch of little elementary school students around his desk one evening and listen to his problems. He said, listen, what I really need is a Draft Environmental Contaminants Act. Okay. Well, I also need a Draft Environmental Impact Assessment Policy and Procedure. Now, a couple of us had worked on the proposed Great Bear River Hydro Project in NWT, so we knew a little bit about this. We thought we'll do that. So we then launched on about a six or seven week task at our course plan, 
policy and procedure, and we got a ton of help from his office. I mean, they were getting all sorts of American experience and Canadian experience. All the provinces across the country were getting into this because, some of you know, the National, the National Environmental Policy Act had been passed in 1971, the Nixon government. And this was the Bible for environmental impact assessment. I'm going to fast forward and say 80 countries at least have copied the legislation on the EIA. That's why those of us who work internationally walk into offices and people know what we're talking about. See? So, Minister Jack Davis, Minister of the Environment, had been down to Washington to find out about NEPA and what's going on. It's an act. Projects are being hung up in court. Furor with public participation. So he came back to me and he said, Davidson, I want a policy and procedure. I do not want an act now. We can do that later. We have to avoid the problems of having in the states. So, let me take a look at my notes here. So we worked with, as I say, with a lot of help and we consulted. Those of you out in Alberta may remember the Environmental Conservation Authority with Dr. Walter Trost, Gordon Beanlands, Barry Sadler, doing early planning there. The best public participation crowd in Canada, although Quebec was right in there with them. Quebec was right on board and so was Ontario. BC was holding back. I can talk about that later if you want to. So the next thing we know, we have to present our findings in a big theater at our college. And all the grass from downtown were there. That means from Ottawa to see, look for people that they may want to fill staff positions because we're supposed to go from the course if we graduate, go on two-year assignments around government as change agents. Change agents. So, Al Davidson was there with his director of policy, and Jack David, David, sorry, Jack Carson was there because this, was, this course is his baby, and all the staff and all the press. And we, so we gave our presentation in about an hour. And we had to go for lunch. The whole crowd's going out for lunch, and our team's all together milling around. And Jerry Duple came by, and he was a UBC friend of mine, quite a bit older than I am, but he was in Treasury Board at that time. He came by and he said to the team, he said, that's the best problem analysis I've ever heard. I thought, oh, that's pretty good. That makes us feel a little better. And then we broke up a little bit. We're walking towards the cafeteria. And John Carson comes by. He said, Pat, let's go up and have a drink in your room. It's a residence. OK, I'm going to have a drink here. <laughs> so I poured him a scotch in the rocks. Big tall man. He stretched out on the bed with all my exam results from this course. And the only thing I was any good at was effective delegation. I think it was about the 98 percentile. I think that comes from the Varsity Outdoor Club, Yale Forestry School. Let me learn these things. You know. Everything else was very mediocre. So he looked, he looked at this and he said, well, what do you want to do now? I said, I want to go and work for Davidson and make this happen. He said, why don't you write him a letter? But you know, my mind is not quite keeping up with what I've got to do here. So a month later, having written a letter to Davidson, his director general called me and he said, okay, we've arranged to move you from forestry over to the Department of Environment, and I have to do a sidebar. You know how crazy some of the names of these offices are? There was a competition in our forestry journal of people who could submit completely confusing names for offices. So I became the chief of the cross-mission coordination of the integration branch <laughs> in policy planning in environment. So we got to work a task force name. There were 12 of us from all over the department. Very good concern, consultants, Arthur E. Little, Patel Laboratories, James F. McLaren consultants. You may not know these organizations now, but they were top of the market. Arthur D. Little had done a lot of work on NEPA, so they were up to speed on what had happened there, where the mistakes had been made. So our task force worked along. I'm not keeping up with these, am I? <laughs> Dorley, you've got to get me on track. Um, okay. So it was April 1972 at our first meeting. I remember looking down the table, and there were 12 of us, a great bunch, all men, ladies. I want to comment on this later. Please ask me to comment about the women, ladies. <laughs> Um, and uh, by the way, Al Lucas.
Davis was there, professor of law from the University of Calgary. He was in Ottawa with the Law Reform Commission, and he was able to join our team. Fantastic guy. So I, I looked down the table, and, and we had to decide what, what our next steps were. I said, one of the first things I suggest we do is go to Washington and talk to NEPA, talk to the agencies that have been impacted by EIA, bring it back and we go and find out all their experience. I said I propose that I phone Lee Talbot, who by now is in Washington. He's the President's Science Advisor, and he's on the Council on Environmental Quality that oversees how NEPA is performing. So I thought, sure, let's do that. So I phoned Lee at his home on Saturday morning. And Martha answered, she said, oh, hi, Pat. Lee's at the office. So I phoned Lee, and we had an hour-long discussion. He's very soft-spoken. So at the end of the conversation, he says this. Pat, can you bring your task force? No, first he said, phone me back on Tuesday morning. I'll see what I can do. So I phoned him back on Tuesday morning and said, Pat, can you bring your group next Monday morning? I've arranged an itinerary for the whole week to meet everybody you said you'd like to see and others. So we went to Washington, Library of Congress, EPA, Forestry, Corps of Army Engineers, Energy, we saw everybody we had to see. So we came back much strengthened from knowing quite a bit about what the states did to itself when they brought out this act and, and how they had to struggle. Where are we now? So shortly after that, I'd say, well, I'd say a month or two after, we had a policy workshop at Cornwall, another conference center where we got very good advice on policies and we had to reflect heavily on where the provinces were, territories, what our international responsibilities were, what was industry thinking about. We were not involved politically. We were left completely alone on that score. So, and we reported to the Department of the Environment Management Committee in August. I've got to check my notes again, please. thinking about your questions you may want to ask me afterwards. Um, well, this, this, gets, this gets kind of, government people appreciate some of this. One thing that Jack Davis, the minister, insisted upon after being down in the States was there has to be strong public participation. And I'm quoting from Bill Couch's book that he's trying to write about all this. He said, uh, September 26, 1973, Jack Davis stated to the Deputy Minister to run government, I want to clear up recent speculation by stating quite clearly that I consider public participation to be essential to the environmental assessment process. Information in all federal assessments will be made public. We intend to release the findings of these assessments. Uh, if you're a government person, you might say, ooh, this is a big change because in Canada, as opposed to the states, I'll mention the states first, they have a long tradition of town meetings from the founding fathers, New England. In Canada, at that time, the time I'm talking about here, in Canada, people looked over the candidates for political posts, voted for them, and said, let them go ahead and do their work. We did not have the tradition of public participation that they had in the states. So, Jack Davis was reading the situation pretty clearly, and I can, as you know, from the days that we started all this, public participation has been a rather controversial subject and sometimes hard to win everybody over, despite the benefits that come from that. So, in the meantime, there was an interdepartmental <coughs> committee on the environment in government who was getting the departments tuned up on what this subject was going to be all about. The Department of the Environment Management Committee was ensuring that everybody knew what was in the proposal. We hadn't gone to cabinet yet. And uh, <coughs> there's a very thorough review with the provinces, with the departments, and so on. So then, the date that I'll never forget, December 18th, 1973, there's a cabinet committee meeting for science, culture, and information. Al Davidson said, this is where the 
minister has to get the agreement of cabinet ministers to take this policy and procedure to cabinet. It's a dark night on Parliament Hill, so I'm going with that. And I'm assuming there'd be like 10 or 12 people that are ready to question us. So, as Bill, Bill Couch wrote after an interview, he said, was the coming of the environmental assessment review process and the first cabinet decision to be looked back on with certain reverence by later generations of people involved in Canadian EIA? Patrick's witty recollections give a different picture. Present were four people. There's the minister, Al Davidson, me, <laughs> and one other cabinet minister was John Monroe, Minister of Health and Welfare. And Pat recalls that Monroe was more interested in reading his newspaper than Davis's presentation. There was no discussion, no questions. When Davis had finished, everybody got up and simply left. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't believe it. The landmark point in Canadian environmental management seemed to Bill Coates all but a non-event. So a couple of days later, Cabinet recorded a decision to confirm the committee's report that they accepted all this. And then a few days later, there's some more discussion to get things smoothed out. And then before it went to the House of Commons, we reported as a, an official policy, a lot of work was going on in things like guidelines and ecosystem approach, cumulative effects, project alternatives, all the things that you people work with. And it was realized that the NEPA concept was a good one, but the size of the EISs, the, the, the environmental impact statements at that time, made the system very cumbersome. Core challenges were everywhere. The evaluation system was seen to be inadequate. So there was a need for a made in Canada approach to all this. So the environmental assessment process, as you know now, would apply to all projects, programs, activities initiated by any federal agency soliciting funds or requiring lands. Crown corporations at that time could opt in, but it wasn't definite that they had to be involved. And departments were to submit um, major projects to review to the Department of the Environment. I won't go into how this was all set up at that time because things had to change as time went on. And uh, I remember at that time that the draft memo to Cabinet noted that the Department of Environment would need 10 people to run this in government. I might point out that it took another five years before we had 10 people working on this. It was not something that was being caught up with a lot of enthusiasm. So the House of Commons announcement took place in March 1974. I went up in the gallery and there was hardly anybody in the house. Jack Davis repeated the cabinet document comments, noting that this would avoid delays and pitfalls that a strictly legalistic approach would cause, although he did acknowledge that this is something that should be done in the future. So John Fraser, who you may remember from Vancouver, was the opposition critic. He questioned the new process if it was sufficiently open to the public and called for a policy and procedure to be based ultimately on legislation. As I say, this was something the task force reckoned quite that. Yeah. So as Bill Couch said, this was an opening shot of a public debate that would continue for almost two decades until the SIA Act was uh, brought in 1996. So here again, I'm quoting from the coach. He's got quite a sense of humor. He said, so Patrick is in the house for the announcement, recalling the galleries are almost empty when the minister rose to tell his good news to the few who were present. So there was no choir of angels who burst forth in joyous song to herald the newborn process as some other EIA commentators later would have hoped would have been the case. So April 1st, 1974, the office was open. It was called the Federal Environmental Assessment Review Office. And uh, about the same time, DOE and UNEP held a big workshop in Ontario in the middle of winter, and we wrote a book. We wrote a book on environmental impact assessment for developing countries. These are artifacts that you may want to look at later. And uh, so the DOE office had highly qualified people, very energetic, and about 1974, I vanished for a couple of years on the executive interchange to manage what is now Clone Crippen's uh, environment group in North Van, which 
Richie Simons, spent two years working on projects like the Rebel Scope Dam. And where are you? Beaufort? Great. Um, and about that time, they have to ask something from the government people. Do we still have regional screening and coordinating committees in British Columbia, in Alberta? Anybody know? Let's assume that they don't exist, but at that time, it was important to have a focal point in environment and for all the departments <coughs> to review all the proposals that were coming forward. And I do remember the coordinator for public works for Prairie Provinces, and I asked him, I said, by the way, how many projects do you screen in a year? He said, well, last year we screened 600. So this is becoming a big activity. It was properly staffed by the departments and government. And uh, we were in a very high learning curve. Let's see if I'm still on the deck here. I'll go over to uh, some of the real action. So from 1975, we're on a very steep learning curve with every project that came along. Imagine the first project of the La Prove nuclear plant in New Brunswick. And there's a big question in Ottawa as to whether we needed to have public consultation. Well, it hit the fan when the report came out that this was not necessarily going to be the case, and Jack Davis got everything turned around at that point. And I remember working on Red Cove Hydro. Got time for a little story. I'm, so I'm I'm listening to the tapes of the hearings of the Red Cove Hydro Project up in northern Nova Scotia. And it, the tape is just left running and people are gathering and chatting, but you can just hear there's a lot of buzz. The meeting doesn't start yet. And the local MLA, whose first name was Hartley, I can't remember his last name, it was Dr. Hartley something got up, and began to expound the benefits of this project. And he went on and on and on. Way up in the background, I heard somebody say, Hartley, sit down! <laughs> and he, but this didn't face him. He went on, on this for another five minutes, and their the chairman, who was a friend of mine, was ready to get started, but Hartley wouldn't give up the floor. So finally, uh, five minutes later, he heard this couple at the back of the room say, Oh, for God's sakes, Hartley, sit down! <laughs> so everything cooled out. Now, these are little things that helped us to realize that you have better have a little better control of your meetings or try to help you. Going sideways, and the next thing on the tape was Harry Hill, the chairman, saying, Well, I guess it's about time for us to get this hearing started. We needed procedures for meetings, and we had to learn as we went along. So, I'll just rattle off some of the other projects that we really learned from. But first, who was excluded from the environment impact assessment policy procedure? Defense was not to be seen. I think it was a long time before defense was on the table in the states too. Agriculture and forestry were way back. Why? Because in the case of agriculture, you have soil conservation measures, you have a little consultation with farmers, but they were not really at the table. And forestry in the federal government is not a big deal. They, they, they research, they help with international affairs, but they're not doing operations on the ground. That is left to the provinces. Being a forester, I remember writing an editorial when EIA began to burst out across the country, and the, edit, maybe the, head of the edit, title of the editorial was, As We Turn the Corner, Watch for the Lights, because I knew that the forestry enterprise was not prepared for the kicking it was going to get from the public over unannounced, untransparent plans, and I think they're still separate. Let's go on a little bit. Uh, Alaska Highway Gas Pipeline Project, which I had the privilege of managing for five years in Yukon, um, you know, only to get three sets of public hearings, technical hearings, and then the company missed an economic window. By the way, that project's still on the table. They spend about 50000 a, a year to keep the right away. Um, Laura Churchill Hydro. Lancaster Sound, oil and gas in the far north. John Klenovic was the chairman, and I remember him coming back from this hearing in the middle of winter, mostly native 
people in the audience. And he realized very early that he could not shut anybody up. They went on, and they're used to just being heard. So he, he developed a policy of just saying, let them talk. And the meeting would go on all night, and then they convene again, and they'd meet the next night, and so on. Not long after that, we got into the El Dorado nuclear processing plant in Saskatoon, where the global nuclear family got together to try and hammer this project because uh, nuclear was a very sensitive subject at the time. And rather than come <coughs> to the microphone to give presentations as a group, people came individually. So you can tell we were not prepared to manage that. I wasn't involved, Bob Conley was. But the hearings went on for weeks. And then <laughs> gradually they just wore everybody down and the project was denied. This is not something that we should plan, but we need to realize that managing people's interest in speaking is not, not easy. How am I doing for time? Before I quit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then uh, nice to have Rick Hoos here. We worked on Beaufort together. That was the first project where we really had major funding for intervener funding million dollars. Very big project. One that I had the privilege of working on as a consultant. And uh, there's a whole story here of another time, I guess. Around this time, Gordon Beanlands and Peter Dunker went back and forth across kind of holding workshops and eventually came up with the publication of an ecological framework for environmental impact assessment in Canada. So if you practitioners are used to the language the Bex and all these other mysterious terms. That's where all these ideas came from, but it was a very thorough consultation effort across Canada. So that was, when was that? 1983. And just after that, the FIRO, Federal Environmental Assessment Review Office, thank God how much kidding do we get over that name, they, uh, they created a committee of scientists and practitioners across Canada called the Canadian Environmental Assessment Research Council. Well-funded, terrific research came out of there. And you can, I mean, I have to tell you that we set the foundation for science for EIA across Canada and in many other countries that are very much quoted and used for our good work there. And at both that time, skill testing question. Put your hand up if you've ever heard of the Brundtland Commission report. Put your hand up high. Not bad at all. At, at an IAIA meeting in Boston, Charlotte, our president of IAIA, as a joke one evening said, how do you how do you define the fact that you're getting older? So my contribution was when you're talking about the Brundtland Commission, someone says, well, what was the Brundtland Commission? Well, there's, a, there's two sides to this. I mean, it was 1987 that it came out. The Brundtland Commission went around the world for three years studying environment and development, the UN effort. There was an eruption of interest in this subject when the hearings were held across Canada. But the commission was disinvited to the United States. That commission and its global work and in Canada really developed the concept of sustainability. Now, I don't want to be theatrical here, but Lee Talbot and I were very much in touch with each other. We always have. He was desperate for the fact that the Reagan government said the commission wouldn't come, have to come here anymore. They never went to the United States. Now, it's a little bit like looking at someone who's just had a incisor tooth yanked out. Because in the States, think about their performance on Kyoto, biodiversity, hazardous waste, these international conventions, they're just not there. Because as in Canada, they, they did not have the benefit of hearings right across this country. The excitement was enormous. And uh, Something here. The, the Brentler report in Canada resulted in our 
minister going to the UN Assembly in September of that year to announce its commitment to the findings of the Brumley Commission. National Committee on Environment and Development, Provincial Committees on Environment and Development, even one in Old Crow. And I think we're still benefiting from having the Brumley Commission here. But this is not happening in the States. And working for the UN as I do now and in the IAIA, I think when we're with our American colleagues, there's sort of a blank in their memory, except for those who came from the States to Canada to make their presentations to the Commission. And there are a whole lot of them. They're all the <coughs> Lee Talbot said, Pat, we tried to mount a rump meeting in Denver after the Commission went through North America, but we couldn't get people interested. Now, why am I going on this way? I want you to go away and think about what that means. The Americans did not have the benefit of learning what this is all about. Go back and read the Brundtland Commission report. When I taught this at UBC Geography, there was a fellow who used to sit in the front row, looking right at me with a baseball cap on, dark glasses, long hair, and he just looked at me for the whole class. And when the, the head of the department and I looked over the comments from the students, I'd ask him. His comment was, there's too goddamn much reading in this course, but you know something? I can't get my mind off it. <laughs> <laughs> Read Brundtland again. What else happened? <clears throat> well, the Rafferty Alameda project came along, which resulted in the minister having to resign. That was Elizabeth May's play. Okay, then I have to say that in 1988, as I was about to retire, I was involved in meeting with the provinces to start to plan for legislation. And I think that that's really a good place for me to close because Bob Connolly and others carried this on. It was a completely new crowd that came in. And uh, I think that's a good place to There's folks on the phone from Yellowknife and uh, Calgary. So uh, we'll take questions from the crowd here in Vancouver first, and then we'll give an opportunity to, to other offices. So you guys think about your questions before I call on you. And uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll pose the first question. Um, so, so what was your broad comment on women? <laughs> 1988 was the first time we had a, a woman on staff. And ever since then, the whole operation has really been Enhanced, strengthened, and I'd just like to think what would have happened if we had men and working and working on this from the beginning. It was an all male undertaking, and we didn't have the benefits of all the strengths and training and unique skills that women have. I'm glad it's changed now. Any questions here in particular? John? Yeah, I have one. I've, I've always been curious, maybe you have some insights in this. In the U.S., where this is all born, how it works is a proponent gives their project description and their environmental baseline to a government agency, and the government agency contracts a consultant to do the assessment. So it's, but in Canada and everywhere else in the world that I've been at, it doesn't work that way. The proponent can the speaker move to a, a telephone or could someone oh. repeat that by yeah. okay. It's inaudible from here. Do you, mind, do you want to come up or we'll repeat it? Yeah. Sure. What come up? It was, the question was still going, so. <laughs> okay, okay, here's John. Can you hear me now? Loud and clear. All right, yeah, so in, in the U.S., the way it works is a proponent uh, gives the project description and the environmental information to the permitting agency, and they contract the consultant to do the EIS, even though the proponent pays for it. But in Canada, and every, as I was saying, everywhere else in the world that I work, it doesn't work that way. The proponent does the environmental impact assessment usually turns a reference negotiated with government and then submits it. And I'm wondering if you have any insights about why that difference exists. I'm acquainted with this question, but honestly I can't comment on it because I don't know what the root of the difference is. Hmm. Um, through IAIA, we have a bunch of American colleagues 
colleagues who live with this all the time, but um, John can, with apologies, can I get back to you on that? Yeah, well, let's have it, yeah. Because it makes a big difference. Uh, it, you know, in, in Canada and everywhere else, impact assessment can then be used as a planning tool by the proponent. Where in the States, it's an end of pipe kind of evaluation of a given project, and you don't have that planning opportunity. We'll continue with that. Yeah. Thank you for that. Any other questions here? Uh, sort of like a loaded question. Can you just, yeah. A question. Sure. Question chair, okay. <laughs> um, probably not as familiar with the IA, okay, but uh, this sounds like a very loaded question. Very few countries around the world have uh, the environment addressed in the Constitution. I mean, is there interest or movement in Canada to have, to have it eventually included in our Constitution, and how will it, will it affect the IA policy procedure? Very good question. I, I want to. I want to do a promo here first, and then I'm going to answer the question. If you consider yourself a student and a real practitioner of environmental impact assessment, you have to read this book, National Environmental Policy Act, An Agenda for the Future, written by Linton Keith Caldwell, professor of law, University of Illinois. He and Senator McCarthy from Montana were the architects of NEPA. You read, I've read this again recently. You know, 10 years of planning, working up to presenting their, their plan to Congress. And NEPA's had a fairly successful uh, life. I don't know whether it's running down now, but Lyndon Caldwell, he died about three or four years ago. I think he was in his 90s. This book is 1998, and he concludes the book by saying, the environment and the protection of the environment must be built into the U.S. Constitution. So I took this up with Ray Robinson, who used to be the head of uh, the Environmental Assessment Office. I don't know whether he was ever the head of SEAL, but in the bureau days. So he's in town here. He's an excellent practitioner in all of this. And I said, Ray, how about this proposal? He thought about it here. He had a lot of time in, in foreign affairs and other parts of government. He said, regretfully, it will never happen. Because to change the Constitution, I'm deferring to a lady with law and legal experience here, that it's just too hard. I can't take it any further, my friend, except that I recommend that you get this book and read it. It's probably in libraries. I think you can get it through in your library. Fantastic read if you're really interested in how much work went into making this happen. Any other questions in Vancouver? How about the other, how about in Calgary? Well, in Calgary, uh, and this is Sandra Lucas here, um, just to make the, uh, the comment and to thank you, Patrick, I'm sitting here with our junior and intermediate staff who are uh, working on environmental impact assessment consultation and um, recognizing that you and others did this kind of thing at their age, mm -hmm. uh, the age they are now, and um, wow, what an accomplishment. So just simply thanks for the context and the perspective. Thank you. I think that we regard NEPA and then our early work in Canada, which is sort of ricocheted around the world. I failed to mention that we were working with Japanese, English, European, Australian practitioners. We had very good lines into all these people. And it was, it was the time of what I call the big boom because uh, environmental impact assessment was fairly understood. These people in the States did a great job and it helped the rest of the world get off on this. So there's still lots of problems. But uh, thanks for that. Did you say your last name is Lucas? Lucas Amulon, yeah. Are you any relation to L. Lucas? And no, not that particular lineage. Okay. Okay. <laughs> How about uh, in Yellowknife? Yeah, we do. Uh, we do have. Uh, we have one question. We've got. We've got one question for Pat. Okay. Uh, sure. Uh, my name is Kevin O'Reilly, and uh, I'm just curious to know. I presume that you're probably still familiar with what's going on with environmental assessment in Canada. Do you think that your original uh, policy? Kevin, do we know 
each other from Yellow Knife work? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I, I've lived here for 25 years. I did work for CARC for about 10 years. I've seen your name. You'd like to see my name as yeah. well. Thanks. Um, I'll say a couple of things here. Um, you heard allusions to naivety in <laughs> our, our thinking about what a big deal this would be years ago from Bill Couch. And at certain times in our work, we really felt that after people got the idea of environmental impact assessment, they wouldn't need a policy and procedure. They wouldn't need an act because it was such great common sense. How little did we realize that this is still scrambling up a slope that is slowly moving below you because you're constantly running into new parties, new challenges, and uh, I guess the worst thing that could happen is when a government or an agency in its own wisdom begins to pull away the resources. A lot of work to be done on, I mean, look, look at monitoring. Monitoring basically is not done. This was in our original cabinet uh, proposal. Monitoring is a lot of work to do there. And the other big failure, I feel, is training. I remember when, uh, when this work hit the federal government and we thought, well, surely there's going to be funding for training. Is there anybody here from the EAO, from Victoria? Same thing, when the BC uh, EIA process came in and we looked for training, we found that there was going to be very little training. So what eventually happened is that some of us began to take leave and train people at the BAM, BAM Center in Alabama School of Fine Arts in those days, week-long courses. And this happened in various places across the country. Training is still very weak. Um, does that answer your question, Kevin, or is there another part to it? <laughs> no, no, I think that's uh, pretty helpful. Uh, um, you know, I don't know, living, or living here in northern Canada, we've seen environmental assessment move in different directions as well with coal management and uh, so on. But, uh, I think those are really helpful insights. I do appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, the, the group that's meeting with us here in Vancouver probably knows about your new Vialowa group and other groups in the north that have taken up EIA very effectively and in Yukon. Well, thanks for that, Kevin. Alan, <coughs> do you want any other questions in Yellowknife? Um, I'll throw in an editorial comment that you gave me the opportunity. I think Pat's comments on... Uh, on uh, adequacy of resources in government are particularly timely when you look at the uh, your cuts that Environment Canada has faced recently. Look at the cuts that are looming for SIA. Um, I, you know, I think that uh, that that speaks a lot about our, our values. But I, I, what Pat says makes is true. When I'm teaching people what EIA is, I tell them it's basically applied common sense at a larger scale. Um, and uh, also another point from the north, a lot of what we do is in small communities and often the subject specialists in those cases are, are the Aboriginal elders and they're given considerable deference and it's like, nice to know that the uh, EIA uh, profession in uh, Canada has its uh, respected elders too. So uh, it's just about one o'clock, so we're just about to wrap up. Are there any last questions here in Vancouver? I, I, I would like to just throw in one last uh, last question. And I know there's a lot of young practitioners here in this room, and uh, and I know you've only you've always been generous to uh, provide advice and mentorship to young practitioners. So is there something that you would like them to leave this with on? Uh, Know, where they should focus their efforts as far as uh, improving the practice of impact assessment? Or maybe that's a, that's a no, question no, over a Stay with it. <laughs> Take training. You vary your employer or your contacts you know, sensibly. And if you want to follow a little in my path, go to the UN and other agencies and travel. Fantastic jobs. That, uh, not, they're not only EIA, but they get you into policy and troubleshooting and evaluation. Um, this is 
sidebar, I think that people have geography degrees make very good project managers in this area because they're more multidisciplinary than you engineers if you're here. And now I, what I'm gonna do, Matt, I'm gonna put my business cards out here and I would invite anybody who just wants to talk about this to get, get in touch with me. Um, I do mentor uh, freely and I'd be pleased to do that. I think that's the best way to handle that question. Well, thanks, Pat, and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed the uh, lunch today, the lunch presentation, and I'd like to thank Pat again. Thanks. Any closing words? Or we actually don't have a date for the next event. We wish we did, so we could invite you all back. But There's keep one it. thing, Matt. Yeah. Nobody asked me about Elizabeth Cushman. Okay. <laughs> Elizabeth came to Yale. So I want you to know that that program that the, those two women created went on for years in national parks and I was in touch with Elizabeth and her husband in uh, Boston recently. And she said, you know, 65,000 people went through that program. And she's now got a big NGO that has young people in the states volunteering all over the place. And this year she was awarded the highest civil civilian award by the so, um, so yeah, let's we'll keep in touch, and uh, I, I'm assuming everyone here is on the distribution list.